that we are discussing today and the title of this event is Hamas from Resistance to Government uh, and uh, with uh, the uh, news we're hearing about current events it is particularly timely uh, as um, reports of um, what, what many may consider uh, changes in the behavior uh, of the uh, Hamas government uh, in Gaza are um, uh, coming out particularly uh, as Hamas continues to evolve from, or, or perhaps evolve from, the resistance movement uh, to uh, a government, or at least um, a government-like uh, entity in the Gaza Strip. Uh, I, for one, believe that uh, one of the biggest mistakes that the, um, uh, that the uh, policy formulating establishment here in Washington, D.C. makes uh, when considering Hamas and Hamas's behavior or other groups like Hamas is to treat the organization very much as a monolith and ignore uh, the nuance uh, and the fissures and the differences and the politics within these movements. And I think that um, the, uh, the book that we're discussing today uh, and, and the author uh, will give us a tremendous insight into uh, some of these nuances that are often missing uh, from the broader debate uh, on Hamas uh, as a resistance movement uh, and a government. Uh, Ms. Paola, Paola Caridi is an Italian journalist and she's been living in the Middle East and Jerusalem since 2001. She contributed to the founding of the press agency La Terra 22 and has worked with L'Espresso, Sol 24 Ore, La Stampa and Familia Cristiana. I probably butchered the pronunciation of all of those things. Uh, Hamas, From Resistance uh, to Government, uh, is her second book and was published in Italy in 2009 and in Palestine in March of 2010. It is, of course, uh, available now in English, and we have, we have copies here as well uh, for sale. She maintains a blog, Invisible Arabs, which I believe is also uh, the title of the previous book uh, that she has written on Arab pop culture and politics, and she has had a keen eye uh, on, uh, on blogs and new media long before uh, the Arab Spring and um, those uh, forms of media famous for understanding uh, popular sentiment in the Arab world from, from at least the Western perspective. Um, so I'm very happy to, to welcome Paola here. Uh, and for those of you watching uh, online, um, uh, after, after the uh, presentation here, uh, in Q&A, please send your questions in via Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you can tweet us, of course, at Palestine Center, uh, or send your questions in on the, um, on the chat wall, on the live streaming page. Um, uh, so if you uh, have a cell phone or anything else uh, that might uh, disturb the discussion today, if you could just uh, turn that off and turn our attention to our speaker today, Paula Brief. complicated matter that means trying to understand the complex picture of uh, Hamas. Um, with Yusuf we decided that I will start uh, telling you why I decided to write a book on uh, this particular issue which is not uh, uh, a common issue not uh, a simple one to to analyze. Uh, I live in Jerusalem since 2003, that means when I arrived in Jerusalem, the second intifada was there. When I arrived in, Jeru arrived in Jerusalem, uh, after some weeks, there was a suicide attack in August and another one in September. And uh, after some months, there was another one 200 meters far from my house. It was not a suicide attack by Hamas, but by another Palestinian faction. But it's to say that uh, I really lived in a, a period in Jerusalem where the, where the terrorism was there. But as a journalist and also an historian, I tried to understand uh, the reasons why somebody, especially very young men, will uh, decided to kill himself and with his with killing himself 
give death to others. Uh, and I started uh, trying to understand uh, who were the protagonists, who were the, the, the men and the young men and the people. And then, because I am, my, my BA was in history of political parties, I started to study the Palestinian politics, and especially Hamas. Why Hamas? Because I think that in the last years, um, really, Hamas and the participation of the Islam, Palestinian Islamist movement to the elections was really the novelty, really the news in Palestine. Uh, by chance I lived in Jerusalem in that period. By chance li I lived in Jerusalem from 2003 till now. And so I saw all the steps. I saw uh, the killing of Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. I saw the death of Yasser Arafat. I saw the transition of the Palestinian politics in another chapter of the Palestinian history. And in this chapter, Hamas uh, took the probably the most important decision in the existence of the movement that say to participate to the Palestinian elections. Not the municipal one, because the municipal elections in 2005 were not so important as a change inside the structure of Hamas, but the, elect the decisional process inside the movement to participate to the political elections for the renewal of the PLC, the parliamentary, uh, the Palestinian Legislative Council, that means the parliament, the parliament in the PA territories, meant really a big change in the way Hamas wanted to do politics. The first change, it accepted one of the results of the Oslo Agreement. That means the BA. The second thing, it accepted to do politics in, inside an institutional framework as the BA and the parliament. And uh, it tried to do politics in, in, the poli in the BA Palestine, not in all Palestine. And I think these were three important pillars of the change of Hamas in 2005-2007. It shows also, this kind of decision shows also the complexity of the structure of the movement. When we think about Hamas, me as a European, you as Americans, we think, uh, as Yusuf said, um, to a monolith, to a stone, it's Hamas, it's the suicide attacks, it's the military wing, it's the, rocket the, the rockets from Gaza to the Negev and to the Israeli cities. Hamas is also a political movement. It started from the Muslim Brotherhood, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. It means it's a social religious movement also. And this part of the picture, uh, and we don't see this part of the picture. We don't see the political part of the picture regarding the movement. And uh, although it's a bit technical, but I want to let you understand how Hamas is complex. Hamas has four constituencies, was what I call constituencies. That means uh, to reach a decision, it's like a mass party in Europe. That means that all the militants participate not only to the vote, regarding a precise issue, but they participated to the discussion. And uh, when they decide something, they take the decision, for the whole movement follow the decision, although the minority, the minority didn't agree with that particular decision. That means they took, take the, the decision with the majority system, and then the whole movement, all the, the militants, although they don't agree, they follow the direction that the majority decided. And it happened with the um, uh, political elections in 2006. Uh, that means that in 2005, all the movement, all Hamas, had to decide whether to participate or not. In 1996, at the first elections, parliamentary elections, 
Hamas decided not to participate. There was a big fight inside the, the movement. There were some of the leaders who decided to run as independent, and after, after three days, they had to step back. One of them is called Ismail Haniye, and is the, the actual prime minister of the Hamas government, the de facto government in Gaza. The situation changed in 2005, and when I asked uh, the leaders of the militants to let me understand that why the situation was different in 2005, um, comparing that situation with 1996, uh, they told me that uh, Oslo was dead, that the, there was uh, the disengagement, and that there was another kind of situation on the ground. And this was the reason many of them, the majority of them, uh, decided not, uh, to participate, to run to the elections. Uh, who decided? The four constituencies. When I say four constituencies, I have to explain a bit. There is Gaza, and we know Gaza. We, thought, we think also that Hamas, it's only Gaza. It's not true. Hamas has militants in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in the refugee camps abroad. Uh, so one of the constituency, probably constituencies, probably the most important thing is Gaza. The other one is the West Bank and Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. Uh, the third one is the refugee camps and the diaspora. So not only the refugee camps but the diaspora. And the fourth is a very strange constituency if we look at it as, as Westerns. That means prisons. Thousands of militants of Hamas, and not only Hamas, uh, all the militants of all the Palestinian factions are inside Israeli prisons. And uh, from Fatah, from the Islamic Jihad, from the Popular Front, from Hamas. But they continue to be militants inside the prison. That means that if the movement has to take a decision, all, all of, of quite all the, 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 the movement have to vote for that decision. And in this vote, there, are, there is also the prison constituency. That means the militants inside the prison, with a very difficult uh, system of voting, they vote for the decision. And for, exa for example, regarding the participation to the elections in 2006, they voted, the majority of them voted for the participation. It means that also many other decisions were taken by the whole organizational structure. I guess also the decision to stop the suicide attacks inside the Israeli cities. I have no evidence. I tried to, to let the militants tell me that they had a vote on the matter. Uh, they didn't say explicitly. One of them told me, of course, we decided on all the very decisive and important issues. Also, the level of the resistance. This is their language. So when I, when I asked them, what does it mean? We decided to raise or to low the level of resistance. If I have to analyze this sentence, I will tell they decided to lower the, the level of resistance. That means not to do suicide attacks inside the Israeli cities. And from 2005 till now, there was not any more a suicide attack inside the Israeli cities. What it happened, that there was a sort of militarization of the resistance, what they call Mukawama, and then that they started to increase the rocket launches from Gaza to the Israeli cities in the Negev, which is a different tool uh, if we look at the, uh, what it happened with the suicide attacks. Not before, because it's not terrorism, I mean it's not, uh, um, uh, how do you call it, colpire in Italian, in Italian. 
you reach civilians, so your target are civilians, also in the Israeli cities, in the Negev, but they don't uh, use a very tragic and powerful and bloody tool as the suicide attacks. In terms of uh, wounded people and killed people, for luck, they are very, 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 very few in the last 10 years. In the suicide attacks were terrible. They uh, were terrible uh, for the number of deaths inside the Israeli cities and uh, for the psychological pressure on the Israeli society. The, ro the rockets are a bit different. Uh, so they decided also on this issue. They decided uh, uh, on the issue of uh, having relations, for example, with the European Union to try to be accepted because uh, uh, Hamas is considered a terrorist organization not only in the, in the US, but, but also from 2003 in the European Union. Until 2003, only the military wing was considered, the al Qassam Brigade was, were considered a terrorist organization. After 2003, also Hamas, that means the political branch of, of the movement. Uh, it was, uh, I think, really very important, the decision to participate to the elections, not only because of this decision, but also in, uh, for the, the theoretical aspects of the ideology of, of uh, Hamas. When we study Hamas or analyze the Hamas behavior, we think, for example, at the Hamas Charter, the Mithak. And it's the only document that we know about Hamas. Uh, the protocols of Zion uh, are inside the Mitak, inside the, the Hamas Charter. Uh, it's a very ideological uh, um, document. But uh, there were other documents. Of course, uh, we don't know them because uh, it, uh, it was a clandestine organization. So we don't know many of the documents. But there was a very public document, and it was the Electoral Manifesto of 2006, 2005, 2006. And uh, if you read the Electoral Manifesto and you compare the Electoral Manifesto of 2006 with the Mithak, you will see that uh, even the language changed inside the documents. Uh, that the second one, I mean, the Electoral Manifesto, was discussed by the Hamas leaders and militants. And that the Mithak was a sort of, uh, in a way, a revolutionary manifesto that had to deal with the Intifada in 1987-89. And then that the electoral manifesto had to be a political program, really a political program, because it had to deal with all the sectors of the society, women, youth, health, uh, education, political representation, individual rights, even individual rights. And it's very strange because in some of the parts, as a European, I see a, a Europe, let's say a European language in this document, which I don't see at all in the charter. I think that they tried also, Hamas tried to be accepted by the West through this manifesto, this electoral manifesto. They didn't reach the point, although if it's true that Hamas was ambiguous regarding Palestine, the 67th border, and not ambiguous regarding the acceptance of Israel as a state, also, West was ambiguous re in regarding Hamas, in the sense that uh, the West accepted the participation of Hamas to the elections, to the Palestinian elections of 2006, and it didn't accept the success of Hamas, the electoral success of Hamas um, through that, those elections. And I consider it a contradictory contradictory, 
And uh, many, dip uh, many diplomats, uh, European diplomats with, with whom I spoke, they told me that they did a big mistake, not to try to find uh, a, a room of maneuvering, uh, uh, of negotiating with Hamas. Because what they understood, and uh, I have to say that as, as an analyst and as a journalist there, I understood in that period, is that the pra pragmatist wing, I don't call them moderate, I call them pragmatist because they are not moderate, they are conservative and, uh, and in the meantime pragmatist, they had the majority, they controlled the majority of the movement and helping them to be accepted by the West with a negotiation of course regarding the, the quartet conditions would have help Hamas to moderate itself. We didn't accept the result, we as West, and uh, it was very difficult for uh, Hamas to uh, control the government with an embargo, with a financial, economic, and political embargo, and that helped the more conservative part of the movement the Hawks, especially in Gaza, to regain a consensus inside the movement. What they told me, for example, was um, it was impossible to, I mean, to have the control of the movement if we were going to the, to the West, for example, not accepted in the airport, or uh, we couldn't meet with the, with, the, with the Western organizations or institutions or, uh, or uh, diplomatic circles, etc. And the other said, ah, okay, the participation was, uh, okay, we tried the participation option, it didn't work, so we come back to the, militant, to the military option or to the, the resistance option or to a more confrontational option. And this was considered really, uh, not only by me, but by many analysts I met and uh, also in the diplomatic circles, a mistake. Because it was a window of opportunity, and we have lost this window of opportunity. I think that now there is another thinner window of opportunity, because Hamas, uh, and we saw we saw it with the Doha Declaration and the Reconciliation Agreement uh, uh, in May 2011 and with the Doha Declaration some weeks ago. Hamas want to be part of what we call the Green Wave. That means the political Islam wave in the Arab world after the Arab revolutions. Uh, in Tunisia, uh, the the, the party uh, whose origins were uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood won. It won in Egypt. It has uh, a good position inside Jordan. They want to be part of this picture. If they want to be part of the, this picture, they <coughs> have to do various things. And some of them they did. First, they abandoned Damascus. Uh, and they moved in different places. They moved uh, some of them in Jordan, but they can't do political work in Jordan. They moved in Egypt, Abu Marzouk, that means the strategic mind of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, of the uh, Hamas as the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, Meshal in Doha in Qatar. And this is one of the first steps. They met, for example, with uh, King, King Abdullah of Jordan. And this meeting was a sort of small turning point in the history of the relations between Hamas and the Jordan, because Jordan decided to kick off, the, to, to let the, the leadership go away from Jordan and settle in Damascus after the, not only the peace agreement with Israel, but especially after the very tragic and bloody 
season of the suicide attacks inside the Israeli cities in 1996-97. And uh, this high-level meeting of the leadership with the King Abdal lament that some, something changed and it was something very important in the balance of the relations between Hamas and some of the states. Of course, Egypt has a very, uh, again, a very important role because mo the Muslim Brotherhood, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, is now gaining ground, elector uh, electorally gaining ground in, uh, in Egypt. So uh, they had relations before, and now the relations are better than uh, than uh, the period pre uh, the period the, the period before 2011 and the Egyptian revolution. The Doha declaration, however, uh, underlined that there is a, a problem inside the structure of Hamas. That means that there is there are a profound, I think, transformation inside the structure. Because uh, because history is facts, and in this in the last five years there was a big change. Gaza is controlled by Hamas. Hamas is the regime in Gaza. That means that the uh, Hamas constituency in Gaza is more important than before. It's uh, I would say not uh, radicalized, but it's more conservative than before because to be in a close area like Gaza, 40 kilometers per 10, close and 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 circled, it doesn't moderate anybody. So it's more conservative than before and controls the territory. The military wing is more important than before. And uh, we saw its importance in the negotiations that uh, um, we saw in the last months with the exchange of prisoners and the liberation of Gilad Shalit and the liberation of other hundreds of, of uh, Palestinian prisoners in the Israeli jail. Uh, the military wing was part of the negotiation, was the most important part of the negotiation. It means it has a political voice now, and we have to understand which importance and which weight it has in the internal structure of Hamas. It's, it's a very confusing, still, picture because the military wing is clandestine, completely clandestine. So we know some of the uh, divisions inside the political wing. We know the position of Mashal, we know the position of Mahmoud Al-Zahar, one of the old guards uh, leaders in Gaza. We don't know the ideas of Ahmad al-Jabari, is, who is considered the head of the military wing. What he thinks about uh, the future, what he thinks about uh, being part of a more um, regional picture as a part of the political Islam in the Arab world. Um, and I think this is the, one of the important things to analyze, what is changing inside the structure, because it will tell us <coughs> what we will have to expect from uh, Hamas in the following months, especially regarding the agreement, the Doha, the Doha Declaration, that means elections, and the national unity government, and which kind of government, which uh, ministers do you want to have inside an, uh, a national unity government, which elections do you want to, do they want to run, the elections for the PLC, that means uh, the parliament inside the, the PA, or the PNC, that means the PLO parliament, it will be very interesting to understand if they prefer, for example, to put pressure on the elections regarding the PLO parliament, because it means to have a representation of the whole Palestinian people. Uh, and it means that they want to have a voice, for example, regarding the agreements that 
the PLO signed uh, uh, with Israel regarding the peace and the peace process. And I think that uh, probably now it's time for the questions. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. We had a, um, an opportunity to chat for, um, uh, for about an hour or so before the discussion, and I found um, everything that, that we had talked about uh, very, very interesting. And I wish we had you know, more time to talk about this in detail, and hopefully we can get into some of the, the questions during the question and answer section, because there's so much, I think, about this movement that we don't understand. So we're very happy to have you share with us all that you've learned in, in covering this uh, over, um, over time. Um, we'll have the question go or the microphone go around uh, for the Q&A period and just a reminder to those watching online um, if you have questions please send them in to us so we can uh, so we can direct them to our speaker today and see if we can get um, uh, answers to those of you watching uh, out there on the internet as well so um, we'll, we'll start up here but just uh, wait one moment for the microphone right. Thank you very much for your, that was a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it. My name is Ty Berry, I'm from Code Pink. Uh, we also were occupying APAC last weekend. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time in the Gaza Strip um, compared to the rest of the world. If you spend uh, even a day there, you've done a lot. But I've been there eight times, and the use of the word militants, because I see so many people in the Hamas movement that are nonviolent, peaceful. The, worst, the words like civilian targets inside Israel, there are nine military bases around Beersheba, and, and as you sit on the eastern side of Gaza, you see right into the military bases right there close by, and there have been many military targets that have been hit inside Israel that are not, they don't promote this information out in the public. But my question is um, more about the elections. Once again, I. I, we went there in 2009, and uh, uh, Medea Benjamin, Colonel Ann Wright, and um, others negotiated with Hamas, and they produced a document that's on the internet, and it was stamped by Hamas that said that they do recognize Israel as much as they recognize Israel as much as Israel recognizes itself, because there are such fluid borders, no one can actually know where <coughs> Israel begins or ends. But when we took this to the State Department, we, we need to get to the Okay, question. when we took this to, to uh, Barack Obama, he refused to even accept this or look at it. What is your, what do you, how do you feel about this, that the United States government refuses to look at documents that are produced by Hamas? I have to say that the United States uh, look at the documents of Hamas, although I, I have no evidence, but there were a lot of letters sent publicly and I, um, I write about this in the book, from Hamas, especially from Ahmed Yusuf, to different American leaders, the Department of State, the President, etc. So I'm quite sure that the United States read these documents. Um, the problem is if, the problem is the strategy if they want to accept these documents as a base to negotiate. And this, and this uh, I, I think that the answer is in the, in the politics that the US were, was, were following in the last years. That means that from the first moment after the 2006 elections, the US decided to support a an embargo or the isolation of the Hamas government. And uh, so it's the same strategy they followed in the, in, during these years, and it's very clear in the WikiLeaks documents. If you read the WikiLeaks documents from the uh, American consulate in Jerusalem or the embassy in Tel Aviv or the, the other embassies in Amman and Cairo, you will see that this is the strategy. Um, 
uh, so it's, it was not only in 2009, I mean, uh, it was in 2007, 2008, 2009. Uh, it was after the speech in Cairo. There were a lot of messages regarding the re uh, recognition of Israel. And uh, it's true, man, there was a sort of uh, ambiguous, disambiguity of Hamas regarding the recognition of, uh, of Israel. They said to me, for example, Israel is a factor. How come we can't we, we don't recognize them? They are there, so they are a, a, a fact. They, they, it's a state. Uh, do they recognize us not as Hamas? They say, do they recognize us as Palestinians, as Palestinian people, or as a, a, a Palestinian state? This they said uh, loudly and many times during the year. Of course, they maintained the ambiguity. And uh, they themselves, they said that they were ambiguous, of course, because uh, the borders are confused borders from both sides. If you speak with um, uh, leaders or uh, people from the right, the, the, the right parties in Israel, they will tell you directly that for them, the land of Israel is from Mediter the Mediterranean till the Jordan River. If the, you speak with some of the mass militants or leaders or people, they will tell, tell, tell you that Palestine is historical Palestine. So the borders are very foggy border, borders from both sides, but because, I mean, politics is negotiation. It's true that in the last years, Hamas many times said that they can start with the 67 borders. That means that they want that uh, the refugees, they can come back to their houses, which is for Israel unacceptable, that they want the settlements to be removed. And this, um, and this for Israel is not so unacceptable formally, but in the facts is unacceptable. And, uh, and uh, the reaction of Israel is, yes, they say that this is the starting point, but then after, the, after that, they want the historical Palestine or they want to remain in, a, in the 67 borders Palestine. And I think that in this case, all the protagonists of the conflict are ambiguous. I don't find the son of many people who will say, yes, I will accept the 67 borders, both from the Israeli side or the Palestinian side. I will probably find more people that say it's impossible to have a two-state solution. Probably we have to go to a one-state solution. But in this case, Hamas, uh, it, it, it is very silent on the one state solution. They are not speaking about it. They are speaking about only the 67 and the PA. Uh, but they are speaking about the PLO. And if they are speaking about the PLO, we have to understand why they are speaking about the PLO. What do you, they want to be? Only a party represented inside the PLO or through the PLO? To be, uh, to I mean, to uh, to be a competitor of Fatah in the representation inside the the, 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 the Palestinian people, the most important uh, organization that represents the Palestinian people. Okay, we got a few. Um, we'll take one more here, then we'll come across to this side. Um, uh, my name is Khaled from the Brooklyn Institute. I wanted to ask you, as a, both a European and an expert on Hamas, do you sense any uh, change in the position, particularly with regard to Europe, as far as the quartet principles are concerned? Uh, Europe is the sort of swing boat, uh, I would say. Um, if, if the current reconciliation arrangement succeeds or is actually implemented on the ground, would you anticipate a repeat of 2006, uh, where you have another embargo imposed uh, or has the EU evolved away from the American position since, since uh, 
2007. I think that uh, in uh, closed circles or behind the curtain, uh, the Europeans evolved. Although I think that uh, uh, there is not so a uh, deep knowledge of the political Islam in the Arab world inside the diplomatic circles. Or do you have somebody who's, who knows the situation, but not so many? Uh, so it, it, it uh, regards not only Palestine, but Egypt, for example, Tunisia. They, we were surprised by the revolutions. They were surprised by the electoral results. So the problem is the knowledge of the Arab world regarding political Islam and not only political Islam. Um, the problem is that Europe is very weak, and we can't uh, uh, think about the fact that the economic crisis will affect also the political uh, uh, behavior of the individual European states. We can't speak about a European Union foreign policy. We can't, because there is no European foreign policy. There is uh, a foreign policy that different states, individual states, are following. So we see that, for example, the United Kingdom has a different foreign policy from before. But we have also to say that the only country that really knew political Islam as an institution, that means secret services, foreign office, etc., was the United Kingdom. They knew perfectly, and we know also because of the documents, that they followed, for example, the negotiations of 2003 regarding the Putna. They were part of the negotiation with some people, of course, and not as a state, not as a foreign, the foreign office. But uh, the, um, the British, they knew the situation. The Germans, they have wonderful think tanks, and they know very well the evolution, the political evolution of the political Islam. The Eberstiftung, the SVP, the Adenauer, they are doing a great job inside the Arab world and in Palestine since many years. But when we speak about, I mean, the, the behavior of the governments, we will have we will see the same weakness we saw in 2006. <laughs> Europe had a possibility to work in the space that uh, there was between the, uh, Israel, uh, the United States position and the Israeli position and uh, the Palestinian. And we didn't use it. So I don't think that uh, something changed now, but it's true that uh, now we have to have a Mediterranean policy regarding Egypt and Tunisia and the other countries and Syria in the next, uh, probably in the next months. And so probably we will change our position regarding Palestine because of the Arab revolutions, but not because we know more about the Arab world. Not because of the experiences in Gaza or because of the... I don't think, I'm not so optimistic regarding this. I'm not so optimistic. I see that they, their behavior in Jerusalem, for example, is the same. If I have to say there is a different behavior, not regarding Hamas or the Palestinians, but regarding the Jerusalem issue. The, the last report of the consul generals, of the European consul generals, was tougher than the reports of 2010 or 2009. And uh, so there is a change. Uh, but it's on Jerusalem. It's not on Hamas. We're going to take uh, some more questions, but I do want to get a question in from our online online audience. We have a, a viewer who sends in a question via Twitter who uh, has uh, clearly looked through your book and, and wants to know, um, in, in your discussion of the sequence of events uh, that led up to uh, the war on Gaza in 2008, 2009, uh, he wonders why you state that uh, Hamas was the one um, to, to break the siege when, it, when uh, in fact, it was Israel in November of 2000. Uh, I said in the book that uh, there was, I was there a few days before that attack of the Israeli military on uh, a, a base, the Hamas base, and uh, it was, if I'm not wrong, on the 4th of November 2008, 
And uh, uh, so I, re I, I wrote in the, in the book, it's, uh, it's there. I was there on the, I remember on the 28th of October, I came back to Jerusalem and there was the attack. Okay, take a, a question in the back, then we'll, we'll come up here. Hi, uh, Dr. Paula, nice to meet you. I'm Helena Coben, and um, I'm like Ty, one of the few people in this room who's probably spent a bunch of time in Gaza since uh, I 2009. Um, I was first there in June. Um, First of all, a, a quick comment about the Europeans. I think we should uh, give a good shout out to the Norwegians and the Swiss and the Turks, all members of European institutions that have maintained robust relations with Hamas after the election. So, you know, it's not that there are no Europeans. But it's not inside the European Union. This is the problem. That's true. But, uh, you know, Norway and Turkey are in NATO, so that's uh, not bad. If you like militaries, which I don't, but um, I have a question about some of your terminology. Um, for example, and I think some of this may be a question of translation, but you talk about Hamas having militants here and militants there and militants everywhere. I mean, in the West Bank, for example, Hamas has more elected members of the Legislative Council than what it has in Gaza. Yes. So to, to refer to Hamas's presence in, in the West Bank only as militants, I think it, for an English-speaking audience, doesn't convey the whole picture of what they're doing in the West Bank and the repression to which they have been subjected there. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of terminological question. Then you um, sort of seem to be setting up some kind of opposition, saying that um, that Hamas or the people in the institutions in Gaza, because of the encirclement and so forth, have become more conservative rather than moderate. I mean, these are stupid binaries that are sometimes used in this country where moderation is always opposed to radicalism. So moderates is basically code for anybody we approve of in Washington, and radical is a code for anybody we don't approve of. So how does conservative fit into that? Um, regarding the West Bank and the militants, the, the, terminology, the, the, the question regarding terminology were right. Mm -hmm. That means that there was an electoral su success. So not, not all the people who voted for Hamas were Hamas militants. On the contrary, many people I knew, Christians, seculars, etc., they voted for Hamas not because they were militants, but because, and not only because of a protest vote, mm -hmm against Fatah, but because of the proposal. That this is the reason I, uh, I think that we have to read carefully the electoral manifesto, because they proposed the different politics, and the people voted for them. So you are right. Of course, the people I interviewed were militants. Not, uh, not legislative council members, for example. I mean, these are members of Hamas's a cadre. Yes. But they're not, I wouldn't describe them as militants. I would just, maybe you would, you know, because you're Italian. <laughs> yes, because militante in Italian means to be part of a party. Exactly. That's, yeah, yeah. that's what I wanted okay. to clarify. Yes, yeah. yes. So it's, it's nice. to be part of a party. So I'm sorry yeah. because I translated yeah. in the wrong way. To be a militant, militante mm -hmm. in Italian means. I have my uh, uh, well, you have a card. <laughs> my card. I have my card of the Communist yeah. Party or yeah. the Socialist Party, the Democrats, the Christian Democrats. Uh, <laughs> and so, in the militante mm -hmm. uh, term, I put the, uh, the, the the people inside the PLC, the elected people. I, the people uh, that run the charities. The the they run the charities, not although carry. not. All inside the charities are militants of Hamas. Right. So we can't, we can't. Uh, Maybe members. Over be a members, term in this, members, in this country yes, than members. Yes, members. Because, for example, we describe the charities mm -hmm. as the Hamas charities. Yeah. Uh, some of these charities, they have both members of Fatah, Hamas, or mm -hmm. members of any political party, but they are part of the charities. So I'm sorry for the uh, for the mistake. And the second conservative. was about what? conservative. Uh, the problem is that, uh, and uh, I think you will agree, the encirclement of Gaza supported also the not the birth 
but the fact that the Salafi sectors now are growing. So, in a way, Hamas had to be more conservative to, uh, because it had a competitor like the Salafis, and so had to be, for example, in the Moors, in the, in the tradition, more conservative, not to have their consensus erased by the Salafis. This is the reason I use conservative in terms of uh, not in Washington, in the Washington <laughs> style, but more in the European style. What kind of socially conservative? Socially conservative, but I have to say also politically okay. conservative, Thank you. not Thank only you. social. Thank you. Thanks for being here today, man. My name is Ahmed Sherma. I'm a graduate from Georgetown University. My questions are on uh, Hamas's source of funding and how that would affect Hamas's future decision making. In particular, if Iran is to cut off Hamas from funding or Hamas is to cut itself off from Iran, and Hamas is able to get funding from Qatar or Turkey or other regional states, would that have to change Hamas's decision making? Would it have to be more pragmatic or political, considering that it will receive funds from states that are not exactly woke states like Iran? Excuse my language, but woke states like Iran. Um, I have to say that uh, the, strategy, the strategy of Hamas is to have not the strategic alliances with states, but tactical alliances with states. So they receive funds, but they continue to follow their path. I mean, the, they, they can receive funds uh, where they found, find funds. They received funds from, us, uh, from the Gulf, for example, especially at the beginning because uh, the birth of Hamas was not in 87, but well before, to 82. And uh, one of the, uh, of the core parts of the, of the structure were, for, for, for example, in Kuwait, in the Gulf. Khaled Meshala came from Kuwait. So we think about the funding of Hamas if, uh, as the funding from Iran to Hamas. But, uh, I mean, Hamas uh, had electoral consensus in 2006, although we, as West, we put a lot of money, but really a lot of money, in the West Bank and Gaza, supporting the secular parties and movements and the pro-Western movements. So I think that we don't have to overestimate the role of funding <laughs> regarding a, a, a political success. And I say this because my first book was on a political, Italian political party, and I went to Cornell to find the, the traces and um, the roots of the funding from the United States to the Social Democratic Party in Italy. It was not the reason from the, for the split between the socialists and the social democrats in Italy. The reasons were deeper and more important than the money. And even in the, in, at the same in the, in the elections of 2006, and I was there, in the municipal and the, and the political, there was, there was a political success. There was not a success because Hamas gave the money to the people. Of course, the charities, they helped the people in the empty rooms left by the PA, for example, regarding welfare, regarding health, regarding support to the widows and the orphans. But uh, I know that it's subtle to, to differentiate between this kind of help and politics, but we have to, because the Palestinians are like the other electoral bodies in the world. They decided not for the money. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Benjamin Tua. Uh, just as a note, another word uh, other than militant that might be appropriate uh, in some cases would be activist, which is has a lot of more neutral uh, connotations. I have a two-part question. Uh, that building on the uh, question that the gentleman uh, here who left uh, asked about Europeans and so on, and despite the absence of a uh, 
very clear European Union foreign policy, there certainly is a differentiation between the European perspective and the American perspective on the uh, Arab-Palestinian conflict and so on. Do you see Europe taking a more active role in the quartet and so on and trying uh, uh, in moving the process forward given the difficulty for the U.S. to, to do that? And the other part uh, concerns the, uh, of my question concerns the origins of Hamas. Could you comment on the role of the Israeli authorities in fostering uh, the Hamas movement with these religiously based groups, the village leads and so on in the 80s? Yes, and it's the 70s. The 70s, uh, yes. Uh, i start from the last question. Um, yes, there is uh, a way of reading the birth of Hamas as, uh, in a way, supported or influenced by the Israeli authorities. It's true that they wanted to give more room to other factions than Fatah. So they gave license to operate, for example, to Muj the Mujama al-Islami, that means the, found, let's say, foundation of uh, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin in the 70s. But, uh, I mean, they, uh, let us say that uh, Hamas started well before. The origins are the, the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. And so the origins are in the late 40s, and so on. So, and the license to operate, for example, they had in the West Bank through the Jordanians, for the charities, for the associations, uh, for the associations, associations in the mosques, etc. So we can't give all this responsibility to the, the Israelis, I would say. There was a, a social and cultural and political ground. And we have also to understand that, in a way, the religious, uh, 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 the religious pillar that Hamas gave, the Muslim Brotherhood, and then Hamas gave to the people in the West Bank was very important for hundreds of thousands of people who were not anymore in their towns were refugees. So it was a sort of glue to put together or maintain together the families, the role of women, uh, the, um, the social structure, even the geographical structure inside the refugee camps. It, this was important regarding the Hamas role before, let's say, before uh, a Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas role before the 90s. And uh, regarding Europe, uh, I don't see this flexibility. I don't see the, the, uh, a, a more important role inside the quartet. Because if you are weak as a European Union, you can't do so much, first. And second, uh, Hamas is in the uh, uh, the list of the terrorist organizations in the European Union. So there's, no, uh, there's not a space of negotiation. This is the reason Helena Goban is right, because the Norwegians and the Swiss and the Turkish, they could do something because they didn't put Hamas in the list of the terrorist organizations. So the European Union is... Uh, Hands are tied. <laughs> I have a question here, just one moment for the microphone, yes, Do you think uh, if the election is held today, Hamas will win in the West Bank and Gaza? It's very difficult to understand, but let us say that, uh, that uh, Hamas is more bureaucratic than before. It's in power. And uh, so the relation between the electorate and Hamas is different from 2006. Probably it would gain more in the West Bank and less in Gaza. Because uh, it's, uh, it's the regime in Gaza. And in, West, in the West Bank is the, is the opposition. And many of the members, activists, and so on, are in the prison. <coughs> so even the leadership. So probably they will uh, gain more votes in West Bank and less in Gaza. But really, it's difficult to understand if Fatah will win in West Bank and Gaza, because it has the same problem. 
And there is, uh, I have to say, that uh, there is not so much trust on political parties in Palestine. And uh, we can't consider Palestine as far from the picture of the Arab revolutions, regarding, for example, the younger generation. They want a different politics. They want different politicians. They speak about a different identity. So we have to understand which will be the next elite, political elite in Palestine. Well, that concludes our time for this conversation today. But uh, I very much want to thank Paula for uh, thank you. discussing this with us. This